Welcome to another week of Fabrengen on the Sicha Fabrengen on Air. This week's Sicha, we're going to talk all about Purim, what the theme of Purim is, the essence of the holiday of Purim. We have a special guest from Atlanta, Georgia, Rabbi Ari Solish. Welcome, Rabbi Ari. How are you? I'm doing great, Yossi. It's great to see you. Thanks for, uh, for the opportunity to be here and can't wait to, uh, to have the schmooze. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so let's jump right into the Sicha. The Sicha begins with Kimu Vikiblu HaYehudim. The Jewish people willingly accepted the Torah that they already have received on Matan Torah. And the Rebbe begins with the three mitzvahs of Purim, uh, or the, you know, the three Matan Slavyenim, etc. And if you could show us in the beginning, the Rebbe explains how the theme of Purim is expressed in these mitzvahs. Yeah, yeah, that's a great place to start. So essentially, what the Rebbe says at the beginning of the Sicha is that Purim is not just another day. It's not even just another holiday. It's supercharged Judaism. It's Judaism on, I don't know, supercharged. It's like on speed. It's like, it's, it's, it's turbo Judaism. So it's not something new, as much as it is the same stuff that we typically do, but just amped up a bunch of notches. So for example, um, it's always a mitzvah to give tzedakah, but on Purim, we go above and beyond. We look for, we don't wait for people to come to us. We look for people that are in need and we give them, uh, we look for two people specifically, not just one, but two people, we go out of our way to give. So it's not just giving, it's giving in a supercharged way. When it comes to gifts, uh, um, when it comes to gifts of food to 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 our friends, so there's all we always give gifts of food. We always give um, uh, uh, you know things that 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 are you know gifts to others, and we give some food and we send food packages throughout the year. But on Purim, we give two foods, and again, we do it with a greater intensity, a greater joy, a greater a greater a, a greater chayus, a greater energy. And when it comes to the Megillah, we have the same idea. Um, and with the Megillah, so we're, we're throughout the year we read from from the Torah. We have public Torah readings. We have other other opportunities to to read scripture, as it were, publicly. But on Purim, we read a book from Nach, from the books of 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 really Ksuvim, from the books of the scriptures. We read it in a scroll. As the Rebbe emphasizes, it's written in a scroll. Who reads? Even the Haftorah we read on Shabbos is from a book, not from a scroll. Right. But we're so excited. We wrote it on a scroll. We took parchment and we got a, a scribe and we wrote it on a scroll. And then we read it publicly and not just and not just once. During the day, we read it twice. So it, it's it's supercharged. It's, it's not something new as much as it is the existing obligations done in a very new way with an additional chaya, supercharged. It's interesting, the Rebbe makes a, a, a chiluk, a difference, a contrast between doing things because you're forced to do it versus doing things because you're doing it on your own. You're doing it on your own accord. And Purim is about the Yidin doing Torah mitzvahs, the Yidin then doing it willingly. And there is a, a, a great difference in enthusiasm. If you could elaborate what changes when you do something in a, in in a, you know because it's beinus or you do are you doing something because you willingly want to do it? Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a it's again it's a great question and it's a great conversation piece. We all know this from our own experience and we know it intuitively. When you when you feel like you have to do it, uh, you know you you drag your feet. You have to do it. You don't want to do it. When it's something that you want to do, you're excited about it. It's you chose it, you enjoy it, you appreciate it. Typically, you're doing what you want to do because you appreciate it. It's like it reminds me of, 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 of the, the famous anecdote where there's a father and a son walking down, down a mountain. And they see, and, and as they're walking down the mountain, they see a guy schlepping up the mountain. He's carrying a heavy sack and he's ecking and becking, he's moaning, he's groaning, he's, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's quetching as he's carrying. And the son, this little boy says to the man, says, what's going on? What are you doing? He says, I'm carrying this, these coals or this wood, whatever the story, up this mountain. I have to, you know, I have to schlep it. It's my job every day. I have to bring this from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. It's killing my back, etc." He says, okay, 
Well, they continue down, the father and son continue down the mountain, and they see another guy who has a sack around on his back and a shoulder and his back. And it's also very big and it looks very heavy, but this guy is laughing and he's running and he's super excited. And the young boy says to the man, he says, what's, what's going on? He says, I just found the treasure and I'm carrying the diamonds up to my house. It's a simple question. Is it a burden or is it a treasure? Did you have to do it or you want to do it? Do you value it or you don't value it? It's, it's a simple, simple uh and, and it's a simple question, but the way you answer that question will make all the difference in the world. It's maybe a, a small pivot, theoretically, but it, it's, it's a huge pivot. The pivot is when you feel like you have to do it, you're not going to do it with energy. You're going to do the basic minimum, whatever you can get away with, right? Whatever you have to do, you'll do. That's it. When you want to do something, sky's the limit. You're going you're gonna to do it with simcha, with joy, supercharged. You're going to look for more opportunities to do it. You're going to go out of your way. You're going to do it the best way. You're not just going to read the story. You're going to read it twice out of a cloth, out of parchment, handwritten. You're going to make it beautiful. There's a, there's a certain, there's an energy when it comes to, uh, to the things that we do willingly, when we do because of, of, of our own excitement, that you just can't compare to, uh, to a situation where you're doing it, you know, begrudgingly because you have to. So in this, with this, the Rebbe builds the case that the idea of Purim the theme of Purim is that the Jewish people fulfilled what or, or accepted what was already accepted with the expression of adding in the way they practice Torah mitzvahs on Purim. We add it on it, like you mentioned earlier, on a turbo level, which expresses the theme with each example. But let's let's move on to the Rebbe's question. The think, initial... just, just to comment on that, I think it's very important to, to emphasize that is that by at Sinai, maybe we're gonna get we're gonna circle, I'm sure we're gonna circle back to this a little bit later. So I don't want to save something for like the for the grand finale, but it's a very important distinction. At Sinai, we were kind of uh coerced in whatever way, whether it's negative, positive, as Chassidus explains, but there was some measure of coercion. In, in the experience. So we said yes to God's proposal for Torah, but it was kind of like, we kind of have to say yes. We were forced to say yes. So our yes is still on a, you know, it's, it's yes, but I had to. So we're doing what we have to do. On Purim, we chose it. We chose it. It's us. We chose it. And thus the obligation, the, the mitzvahs, the, the traditions of Purim are ones that reflect a posture of choice as opposed to a posture of force, which is a completely different experience. Right. And, and I, I also would like to add and say that the process of the way that the way the terror was given had to be done in this order. You, you can't you can't choose something that you have no idea what it is all about. So in a certain way, we went through the process of being forced or taking on the Torah from the Eidushtar Milmaila Lamata. And then Purim is the expression where we we really express how we willingly um, love Torah mitzvahs and do it with enthusiasm. And like Josh Gordon, al likes to say, with alacrity. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, And I think it's very important that, that that's the order, as you're saying, because, I mean, think about an education. Right? Think about a child. The first thing you tell a child is, okay, this is what you got to do. This is what you can't do. And then you explain the whys. You can't explain day one all the wise, the child appreciates the value of going to bed on time or the value of not eating candy before dinner. I mean, yeah, if the child appreciates it, it's going to be a richer experience. But when the child is first developing, there's there needs to be a little bit of uh, a Kabbalah Salah, as we say, a little bit of an acceptance of authority. So there's kind of like step one, Sinai 1.0, right, is... As you said, Mamayla Lamatis, from above to below, it's like this is what's expected and this is the way it's going to be. And we said, yes, Nasa Vanishma, we're going to do. There's Nasa and then there's a Vanishma. It took a thousand years, but, but Sinai 2.0 happened at Purim. A thousand years later, we said, you know what? We're in. We're opting in. We like this. We're opting in. And thus, it, it turbocharges. And what's interesting is, is that when it's like you mentioned in that analogy, when we take the initiative, now the, the, our input is with greater energy, with greater energy, with, great, with, with more infinity, it's more infinite. There is more 
of Torah and Mitzvahs when we're involved, which is a, a very important component, that it's not just about the Abish there, about God giving us the Torah, but if we want the Torah to really do what the Torah is supposed to do, we have to have that from, from our end. And this leads us, and, and right here you have a perfect puzzle. Until this point, we have a perfect puzzle. There are no issues. Purim is amazing. Kimu v'kiblu. And then the Rebbe gives us a, a curveball here with a question that how do we know the mitzvahs of Purim actually are a haisafa, are an added measure to, let's say, mitzvah tzedakah? Um, it, 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 it comes out from other sources that it's not a haisafa in those mitzvahs. It's not an a- added bonus to those mitzvahs, but on the, on the contrary, it really is all about the sauda. It's really, like, like you'll, you'll share, it's really an exchange of making sure people have the meal of Purim. So if you, you first could elaborate on, on the question, yeah, and then we'll yeah. go from there. It's, it's the way, as you said, the way the Rebbe structures this is you almost had a dayenu, right? You almost right. hit like after, after the first page or so, you're like, wow, I think we're good. And then the Rebbe's like, hold on, we're not done yet. I'm not done with you yet. We're just getting started. Because all of this presupposes that Purim is about supercharged mitzvahs. But the Rebbe says an argument could be made, we're, made, we're not going to stick with this, but an argument could be made to say that no, the um, like the gifts of food that we give and the tzedakah, the, 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 the gifts of the poor, the money to the poor that we give on, on Purim, it's very pragmatic. It's not over the, over the top. Over the top, maybe it's pragmatic. You know, there's a mitzvah to have a soda. There's a mitzvah to have a meal on Purim. Well, maybe part of that obligation is to ensure that the other guy has some food. So whether it's giving the food to the other guy or whether it's giving money to someone poor to buy food on their own. So whether it's to, 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 to participate in someone else's meal by sharing gifts of food. So we're all like eating together, so to speak, or helping someone who has no food by giving them money so that they can get a, to get a meal in the first place. Maybe it's not going over the top. Maybe it's not supercharged. How do we know that Purim is an expression of, of owning it at the whole premise of the mitzvahs of Purim express the ownership and above and beyond and turbocharge and 2.0? Who says? Maybe it's 1.0. Maybe it's part of the suda, the mitzvah to have a meal on Purim includes to participate in someone else's meal and to ensure that someone else has food. It seems very reasonable. So maybe it's not over the top. Maybe it's just part of the protocol. How do you know? That's the Rebbe's question. Right. right. Builds it on a Rambam also, which is a very elaborate conversation, which, you know, we can, we can get into. Yeah. Let's jump straight into the Rambam. Yeah. And, um, and from there, the way the, the, the Ram, many times the Rebbe, looks the, uh, about the placement of the laws. Where are they placed in halacha? In the order of the way the Rambam placed it, we could extrapolate we, what the Rambam's train of mind or what the halacha, the, the, the theme of what the halacha represents. So let's jump into the way the Rebbe analyzes the placement of the, the, the halachas of Purim in the Rambam. Yeah, and, and I think just to, to lead into that, I should mention that the Rebbe quotes the Rambam, where the Rambam says essentially that when it comes to giving uh, money to the poor on Purim, again, we're supposed to give at least two people, individuals in need, two individuals in need, we're supposed to give them matanas levyonim, gifts to the poor. So when it comes to that mitzvah, the Rambam says, this is an incredible mitzvah, and it is um, in the language of Rambam, it's greater to add in your gifts to the poor, right? Yep. Than adding to your meal. In other words, if you have to allocate your budget, your poor budget, what's your percentage? I, that's not a personal question because we, we're all, but Rambam holds up a mirror in a sense. Says, right. oh, one second, one second. You're spending all this money on the holiday. Okay, how did you allocate? How much money did you spend on the meal? How much money did you spend on cellophane wrapped gifts? And how much did you uh, manas, to get, or give some food? And how much did you give to the poor? Right? Is it like you know five hundred, a thousand, and and fifty dollars? You know five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, and fifty dollars? Or so Rambam says it's actually preferable to add, to to give more in your gifts to the poor 
than what you spend on your suda and your meal, what you spend on, on gifts of food for others, for friends. He says, why? Because there is no greater joy. There is no greater joy than the joy of, of gladdening the heart, the hearts of those in need. And this is divine because God loves this. God loves when we gladden the heart of the poor. It's, it's a divine quality. Um, that's what he says. He says, It's similar to the Shekhinah, yeah. similar to the divine experience. So the Rebbe on this has two different ways of looking at it, right? How do, how do we look at, because this is a very unique take on Sadaka, because essentially one could argue giving money to the poor on, on Purim is like giving Sadaka all year round, but sounds like a bit supercharged, but it's still essentially giving, giving Sadaka. But two things happen when you give tzedakah. Two things happen. Number one, you support someone in need. You give them money. Number two, you bring them joy. So the question is, so what's, what's primary, what's secondary? I mean, I guess you could say primary is actually giving them the cash they need. But there's also an element of the joy. But when it comes to Purim, because Rambam talks about giving money to those in need, there's the, the laws of, 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 of giving to the poor. Rambam has a whole section of laws about tzedakah. Right. But then he has the conversation about Purim. When it comes to Purim, he talks about the simcha, the joy. Right. seems like it's a bit of a different genre. It's not typical tzedakah. It's the primary objective here is to make them happy, to make the recipient happy. It's not just about, so all year round, essentially, all year round, tzedakah is about hooking up a person with money. They, someone's in need, they need money, give them the money. Does it make them happy? Sure. But the main thing is to hook them up with the money. On Purim, it seems like a prime, based on Rambam, the primary objective is to make them happy, to, right. to, 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 to gladden their hearts. So the, the Rambam also uses the Lushan. He points, he, he points out Yusayimim and Almanis, orphans right. and widows. Like why, if there are people in need, why point those people out? And the Rebbe elaborates to say yeah, that there's the a Rebbe joy element. Who, sa who says? that the widows and the orphans are poor. Right. In other right. words, if they're poor, so then why single them out? They're poor. So you're giving gifts to the poor. And if they're not, so then why are you giving them? You're supposed to give to the poor. So wh why does Rambam, why does Rambam conflate? Why does he, why does he kind of combine the poor with the widow and the orphan? The widow and the orphan seem to not be the right recipients for this, the, the gifts of the poor. If they right. are poor, then they're poor. What? So Rebbe says, no, because it's about the simcha. It's about it's about bringing joy to those that are that are in need of joy. So it, it yes, it manifests itself as as money to the act to, to, to people literally that don't have money, but it also manifests as acts of kindness and maybe money also to the widow and the orphan who the Rebbe says, but they're at is the kind of like you know, in a way of uh humor, not really humor, but like kind of I don't know exactly the best way to translate it, but the Rebbe says. One could say that the widow and the orphan is in need, oh, right? Well, is poor is in need of joy, yeah, and yeah. so it, it's it's it could be considered aniim those that are impoverished, if you will, on Purim when it's all about the joy. So essentially, the Rebbe establishes again based on how the Rambam kind of differentiates his conversation about giving to the poor on Purim versus the rest of the year and his general laws of giving to the poor, it seems like the primary objective here is about the joy upon which they're asked the question, well, how does the Rambam know this? How does the Rambam know that the mitzvah of giving to the poor on Purim is about the joy element and not just about the pragmatic, uh, they need money, give them money. How does he know? Right. This? right. So to this, the Rebbe posits, oh, maybe it's about the meal. Again, going back to the meal, maybe how does the Rambam know this? Because the whole point of giving the, the poor is that they can have a meal, which the meal is about simchas, about joy. So maybe that's how my, that's how Rambam knows that it's all about joy. Ultimately, the Rebbe doesn't, doesn't end with that, but that's, that's the working theory. That's the working theory. That you have the gifts of food are all about the meal, which is all about joy. And you have maybe the gifts of, of money to the poor is also about the meal. And then it gets into what you said about the placement. About the right. place, yeah. Um, and the should I keep on going? I mean, it's yeah. Go, go. So what? So what? So from here, so from this, also the Rebbe asks, why is it Daimel Why did why specifically? 
regarding Purim and regarding helping people who are unfortunate and they, they're missing, uh, they lack simcha, they lack joy. What, what's, why is that specifically similar to the Shechina, Daim Shechina? And I think from there we can jump into Sif Hay. Yeah. Yeah. And the Rebbe says, so I, I kind of preempted that a little bit. I, I jumped the gun a drop. But yeah, in Sif Hay, the Rebbe essentially says that if we, if we move away from gifts to the poor and we focus on Shalach Manus, it seems that the Rambam indicates that when we give Mishlaich Manus, when we give gifts of food to a friend, it's about the... It's about the Mishnah. It's about the feast. It's about the joy of the feast. The way the, way the Rambam combines the halachas, he talks about the feast and then he talks about the gifts of food. It seems like the food is supporting the feast. It's like there by your feast or it's like it's an extension of your feast. You're feasting. You're also giving to someone else. Kind of like what I said before um, earlier, but it's, it's, it's a part of the feast. It's part of the joy, the simcha of the feast. However, however, Although you could also say that about gifts to the poor, that it's also about giving them what they need for the feast. This is what you said before, what you alluded to, the fact that the Rambam does not include the laws of, in, in the laws of Purim, does not include the little paragraph or the section of, uh, of regarding Matanas of Yenim, the gifts of the poor, in the same halacha that he talks about the meal and the gifts of food indicates that it's not for the meal, it's not for the food, but there's a different agenda behind it. It's not all about the, uh, the, the, the it's not about the, the simcha of, of giving to the poor is not about the feast specifically. There's another rationale. It's only the, the, the gifts of food that are connect, that's connect, that the Rambam connects with the feast, but not the gifts of money. It's uh, it, it's 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 a bit of a different. It's in a different placement, and and that the Rebbe says indicates that um, that that there's a that that is a distinction. There's a footnote, footnote thirty two. It's on page three sixty eight in the original Sicha. The Rebbe says it's known that the division of the halachas in Rambam is bediuk, is very precise. Not just what he says, but where he says it. And how we split up the laws, like where the paragraph breaks are, where the halacha breaks are, that itself is instructive. So if the gifts to the poor, if the money that we're supposed to give to the poor was all about enabling their feast so that they, so that they could be happy, and that's why the simcha is for the feast, if it's all about the feast, then that should have been included in that halacha about the feast. The fact that it's divided into its own category means that according to Rambam, it's irrespective of the feast. There's nothing to do with the feast. There's a simcha, there's a joy in giving to the poor, giving money to the poor. That's not about your feast. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about the food. It's the joy in the midst of itself of giving. That's how the Rebbe kind of summarizes that idea. Right. So later on in the Sikha, the Rebbe focuses, focuses on Lasais Aisam Yemei Mishta, Yemei. You may miss that days, days of Simcha, the theme of Purim, according to the to Rambam. But let's let's go back a little bit and say and, and just go back to the original question. The original question was of the Sicha was that we had this perfect fit, perfect design. We explained how Kimu Vikibla Yehudim. Then we ask a question: well, maybe it's not turbo level Judaism. Um, maybe it's for a different reason, for the meal. Uh, to, for everyone to, to have an opportunity to have a meal. And from there, the Rebbe brings the Rambam, which we also see that there, you know, it could be argued that there is a different reasoning for the mitzvah. It's not just that, that it proves and expresses that they took the, upon themselves mitzvahs willingly. So how do, we, how do we learn Rambam now that sort of leads us into the final answer where, where yes. we could reconcile everything? That's, that's where that division of the halacha breaks that. It's it's literally hinging on on what I what we just said a moment ago about where the placement of that of that law is in Rambam. In other words, we started off by saying, "Look, Purim is two turbocharged mitzvahs, right? You give tzedakah above and beyond. You give food to friends above and beyond." Then the question, as you as you aptly put it, the question is, who says? Maybe it's just about supporting the feast. To support the feast, you do these things. And in truth, the Rambam could be learned that way. 
You could learn the Rambam that the gifts of food to the friend and the gifts of money to the poor are about supporting the feast. So maybe it's not about joy. Maybe it's about the feast. Maybe it's very pragmatic. If you have a feast, you have to make sure that you're taking, that you have food for someone else, that you have gifts of money to the poor. That's part of the feast. Who says it's joy? Who says it's above and beyond? So to that, the Rebbe explains, no, the joy is not about, it's not about the feast. The joy is not only subservient to the feast. The joy is standing on its own. And literally, how do you know it's self-standing joy? Because the division of that halacha, because there's a there's one law where the Rambam talks about the feast and another law where the Rambam talks about gifts of food, uh, sorry, gifts of money to the poor. And thus it is standalone. And of course, it's not just based on the Rambam's division. I mean, that's a way to see in Rambam itself that it's not only about the feast, but then the Rebbe explains, as you said, the fact that the Pasuk in the Megillah, the verse says, that it's Yemei Mishta V'Simcha, Purim itself are days of feasting and joy. It's, 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 a, it's a day or days of joy. Mishta V'Simcha, days of joy. And thus, there, there, there are, as the Rebbe points out, there are three, it's logical to say also that there are three different mitzvahs, three independent mitzvahs, three independent obligations. You have that stem from the joy. In other words, let's, let's, maybe we can do like cause and effect. Is it? Is it that we have? Is it that we have a feast, and we give gifts to of uh, uh, food to friends and give money to the poor in order to have joy, or because they're days of joy, therefore, how do we express it? We go big, and the latter approach is the way the Rebbe is explaining it. Because Purim is essentially day a day or days of joy, because Purim essentially is joyous. And of course, we know the deeper reason why as we started the conversation. But because Purim is joyous, so therefore, of course, you're going to have a wild, a, 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 a big bash. Of course, you're going to give gifts of food. Of course, you're going to give money to the poor in a way that's completely beyond the normal. So that's the way the Rebbe explains the Pasuk and the way the Rebbe explains the Rambam is that you do all of these things. And Rambam connects the, the tzedakah on Purim to simcha, not to pragmatic, you know, helping someone out, helping a brother out with some gelt. It's about joy. Why is it about joy? Because you may me may mishta a simcha. Because it's literally days of joy. That's why we're doing it. We we do these things as a response to the joy, not to create the joy. We're not that trying to generate the joy. We're not there trying. We're not trying to get ourselves in the mood of joy or trying to build the joy by doing these things. We're not, it's a natural response to the joy when you're very simply. And the Rebbe doesn't necessarily say that these analogies, but I, I think I think it's pretty. Uh, uh, essential to the way the rabbi explains it. When you're in a state of joy, you're much more open. You're going to give, you're going to dance, you're going to move. It's like the famous, uh, I don't know why I say famous because we heard it at Fabrengans all of our lives, right? It's like when you're at, and maybe it's from Chassidus somewhere, I'm sure there's a source of it for it. You know, when the father when is dancing at his daughter's wedding, He'll dance in the circle with the guy he doesn't get along with so much, right? It's like, and he'll have a table of food for anyone who wants because it's a simcha and you're, you're in a state of joy. You're not, look, you're, not, you're not in a state of like judging and, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm here, you're there. I like you, I don't like you. It's not, you're not in a state of, of discernment, of gvura. You're in a state of chesed. It's unbridled. It's open. It's generous. You're in a state of expans expansiveness. Yeah. When you're in a state of simcha, simcha parrots together. Simcha breaks the rules. Simcha breaks down. I mean, it's other, right? It's a perfect time to talk about this. It's a time of joy. In times of joy, Hagbalah's boundaries are broken. It's bederach memel, it's automatic. So therefore, it's not that, you know, we're trying to be happy. So we got to throw a meal to be happy. And to get happy, you know, maybe give a gift, a food to a friend, and then you'll get in the mood. Or maybe give a little extra tzedak and it'll kickstart you. No, these are in response to the joy. We're, we're in a state of, I mean, ideally, right? We're in a state of joy. And because we're in a state of joy, it naturally manifests itself in a big meal, in a joyous meal, in, a, in gifts of extra gifts of food to friends over the top and extra tzedakah that we're giving specifically because we're in a state of joy and that bubbles over to the other. And then they're going to feel that joy. And that's what the Rebbe explains the Rambam. The Rambam wasn't saying Although it could be argued, and the Rebbe spends like two pages, uh, right. you count pages, multiple pages, multiple sections of the Sicha on establishing how you could have learned the Rambam that this is all very in the box. 
It's all very normal. You have to have a meal. So you have to make sure that someone else has. And the Rebbe says, nope. Just look at, look at how the Rabbim divides it. It's got to be much bigger than that. It's got to be just unbridled, breaking the box. It's funny. The Rebbe uses a division in the Rambam to right. talk about opening up the divisions. Anyway, a little uh, analysis there. But it's all about opening up. It's Yemei Mishra Simcha, as you said. It's about days of joy. And because there's days of joy, it's manifest how you eat. You're going to eat different. You're going to give different. You're going to hang out with your friends differently. Everything's going to be different when you're in a state of joy. So automatically, it manifests this way. So I want to jump in just for the order of the Sikha. The beginning of the Sikha, the Jewish people received the Torah, Matan Torah. And the first level, the, the, the basement level was, we were sort of forced uh, into, into receiving the Torah. We received the Torah, however way. Then comes Purim, Kimu Vikiblu. The Rebbe gives an insight. What does it mean that we accepted it willingly? That we added in, in, in mitzvahs, we did the mitzvahs that we were commanded to do back in the day by Matan Torah, we did that willingly with enthusiasm and with more. Now, after we learn the Rambam, the Rebbe adds another element to the expansiveness that we first spoke about in the beginning of the Sikha of, of, of doing it because of you, because of your choice, because you want to do it. There's another dimension in that. In other words, how big could that willingness expand to be on the highest level? How could it be? How could you be the best version of yourself? And the Rebbe learns the Rambam where it's about Yemei Mishtev Simcha. The joy will bring about a person to the highest level of expansiveness. I actually want to share an interesting, uh, we all know this story, but I want to share this story, and I think it very much connects to the Sikha. So we know the famous story, Reb Zusha and Reb Elimelech, the two brothers, and they were they were once thrown into prison for, for, for they were accused of, of being thieves. And in the, in the cell, with a, bunch, with a bunch of other inmates, um, Reb Elimelech realizes it's time to dive in Mincha. So he gets up, he starts doing the Mincha preparation, and his brother, Abzusha, turns to him and says, you can't daven in here, there's a, there's a pail. The pail is, it's a toilet, it's, it's a bathroom here. You can not let a daven in a bath, in, near a bathroom. So Ramel Melch sits down, he's saddened. He's, you know, he's, 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 yeah, he's at a low point. And Abzusha turns to him and says, why are you sad? So he says, I, because I can't daven mincha. So Abzusha says, the same Abish there that told you that you should have a mincha told you in Shulchan Aruch that in this situation you now have a daven mincha and therefore your 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 godly expression your connection to the Abish there is in this way. So so Rabbi El Melch lit up, he stood up and he and he and Reb Zushan El Melch be, began to dance because they were doing what their mission is because that's the halacha that's the law. So the guards outside see these two Jews dancing. They turn to the other inmates and saying, "What's going on over here?" So. They said, what's this about? So the, the, the guy said, it's about the pail. So the guard said, oh, I'm going to show him. They go in, they take the pail, they throw it out. And Abeli Melech and Abzusha turned to each other and they said, Mincha. So <laughs> in this story, in this story, you have, you have like, it's almost like you have these, these dimensions of the Sikha. In the beginning, Abeli Melech, he wanted to have a Mincha. He was in the cell. He felt willingly with enthusiasm, with alacrity. He wants to have a Mincha. Comes Reb Zusha and says, "Not now. Now you have to do something different. It's almost like it's almost like they're let down. He's let down. He can't do it the way he wants to do it." And then he enter, Rabbi Elimelech enters into a new dimension where he's besimcha. Now they began to dance. Why? Because they realized that this is what the Ebushter wants, and they they entered into a new state of reality beyond the willing willing attitude of what Rabbi Elimelech first had. He entered into an infinite level of serving Hashem with Simcha. And I think that's the message sort of at the end of the Sikha. If you could, if you could jump in where, where the rabbi talks about Itzumay Shal Yoyim. Yeah, yeah. That's a perfect segue. In fact, I thought of that exact story for the exact moment <laughs> of, this, uh, of this pivot. And, and I want to set this up by, under, by, first of all, general comment. When you learn a lot of the Rebbe's Torah, whether it's a Sicha, also Maimarim, in, in the Rebbe's uh, Maimarim discourses, you see this almost every time. It follows a simple process. One, two, three. One and two are the binary, either this way or that way. And the third is, but we can have it all. 
<laughs> right? It's like, it's either Mamali, Saibiv, Atmos, right? It's like this way, this way. Nope. There's a, there's a higher level that includes everything, right? And that's what this does. And let, just that's the structure. One, two, three. So that's the structure here as well. One, two, and we haven't yet specified three, but we're about to get there. And you led into it perfectly. What's the one? What's the two? All right. Step one is Sane 1.0, 3,333 years ago, right? Hashem gave us the, the, the Torah, the Ten Commandments. We said, Nasa, Nasa Vinishma. Hashem held the mountain over our heads and he says, What you want it? You want it? We said, Sure, I guess. <laughs> what's the option? So what's what's the advantage? The advantage is we accepted it. What's the disadvantage? We were kind of forced into it. We we said yes, but were we really present? Did we really choose? Were we really into it? I mean, just take a look 40 days later, what was going on, right? Were we really into it? I mean, right. 40 days later, we're dancing the horror around the golden calf. I mean, were we how like how 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 deeply ingrained was it? Did we own it? Right? Was it in us? arguably not mount sane is not holy to this day for that reason it's mamala lamat is top down so the disadvantage of top down the advantage is it's coming from god there's total submission all of that is wonderful the disadvantage is we're not really involved that much it's not really us okay that's 1.0 2.0 because so far we've done we've done two things right so what's 2.0 2.0 is purim purim is well at least the first way of understanding purim that we've said thus far is where we accepted it, we chose it, we were into it, we were excited about it. Great. That's great. It's us. It's us. Here's the problem. When it's all about our feelings, because we want it, we chose it, it's precarious. It's precarious. Because today you chose it, what about tomorrow? Yeah. If it's all about my mood, what happens when I'm not in a good mood? What happens then? Yeah. What happens when I don't like it? When it's not exciting, it's like a relationship, right? Like any relationship. Is it based on commitment or based on accessible feelings of love? If it's based on commitment, then maybe I don't, where's the love? It's commitment. You could be committed in business also, right? Where it's, so it's commitment, which is great, but it's not, maybe you're not into it. Maybe you're not going above and beyond. Maybe you're not supercharged with the other because it's commitment. So then you have the other extreme. The other extreme is love, but love is fickle. Love is peaks and valleys. Love goes up and down. It's like a seismograph. It's you know up and down and up and down and up and down. So emotional swings. So the Jews were into it. At times of Purim, we're into it. Yeah, the problem is what happens when you're not so into it? Uh, what Now it's all based on how you feel. That's also a little bit. Q number three, Q 3.0. It's not Sinai 1.0. It's not 2.0. It's now 3.0. What's 3.0? The best of both worlds. The best of both worlds is where you have joy in the commitment. That's the ultimate. You're excited about the submission. So level 1.0 was submission. 2.0 was excitement. 3.0 is now you're excited about the submission. Oh, now we're talking. The Rebbe says, where is this manifest? Where do you see this? In the meal. Back to Rambam. He says, how do you have, what's the meal supposed to look like? The Rambam says, Rambam's a very logical guy, philosopher, doctor, right? Cares about the liver. What does the Rambam say? Yeah, I'm paraphrasing the Sikha, right? What does the Rambam say? He says, you should be inebriated, you should have a meal, have uh -huh. some alcohol, be inebriated to the point that you conk out, to the point that you, you fall asleep, you lose consciousness. That's, that's how big you should go. But at the same time, the same Rambam says that if you do this on a yamtiv, yeah, it's hoilulus, it's it's frivolity, it's not it's not this nishkasha, it's not kosher. But on Purim, it's okay. Why is it okay? Because that's 3.0. 3.0 is you're excited about the submission. Where's the submission here? Transcending logic, you're transcending the mind. What's the idea of drinking to the point that you pass out? Again, consult your, uh, this is not medical advice here, but the point is that it represents the idea of transcending what you understand because the danger of 2.0 is that you're only going to base it on how you feel and what you understand. And then it's limited. Then it's limited. That's the extent of the relationship. When you feel in the mood, when you get it, when you understand it, uh-oh, 
<laughs> what kind of relationship is that? Only when you feel excited about it, you're going to be there for your spouse? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's too dangerous. So what's 3.0? Is that I'm excited. The, the, the mishta, mishta simcha, the meal is with joy. I'm excited. But how does it ultimately end? With submission. I'm excited about the commitment. And that's the story that you told. That's the story of Rabbi Elimelech and Rabbi Zusha. That's the story. They're excited. They danced around the submission. The Abisher says, God says, he wants to dive a mincha because he's excited about mincha. And then his brother tells him, Zusha says, it's not about you. You're excited about mincha. It's not about you. It's about what God wants. And then they danced around the pail. They, they, they had joy in the submission. That's yeah. 3.0. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. It's 3.0. It's not Sane 1.0 or 2.0. It's 3.0. Have it all. It's your dancing around the submission. Hashem said, God says, don't pray with the, with the bucket of waste in the room. Okay, I won't. That's 1.0. Oh, I would really love to. I really want to. That's 2.0. I'm going to dance because God said no. That's 3.0. I'm dancing. I'm dancing out of submission. I'm excited. I'm excited about the opportunity to turn off my brain and to let go and to let God. That is, that is remarkable. That's astounding. The rebel learns that Purim, the Rebbe learns this into Rambam, into the whole story, that that's what Purim is. Purim is not 2.0. 2.0, we're past that already. We're past that. It's 3.0. Purim mm -hmm. is really 3.0. And the Rebbe says, ultimately, it goes even beyond the meal. Ultimately, the Rebbe concludes the Sikha with saying, this is reflected or manifest, expressed to the greatest extent, back to gifts of the poor. That's where it's really manifest. It's really manifest when you get tzedakah on Purim, you're excited about it. You go above and beyond. Remember, you're budgeting. According right. to Ramadan, you budget more for that. You're excited. And who are you giving it to? An ani. You would think, an ani, I have to give. I have to give. I feel obligated. I feel guilty. I'm getting all these emails, right? This fund, that fund, I'm giving. All right, I'm submitting, right? I'm excited to spend them myself. I'm excited to, to get some, you know, some good tequila. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tzedakah, I have to give. Combine the two. Be excited about submitting. Be excited about giving tzedakah. That's in, other words, in other words, the greatest, the greatest irrational or bleak vul or stepping out of yourself is not... In, in, in getting inebriated, right. but, but in giving to somebody else what they lack. And, I, and, and the way the Rebbe talks about what, what a person lacks, it's, it's not just monetarily, but it's, it's, it's also, it could be also related to Simcha. And that's why the Rambam choose, chose Yusem Valmonis. The, right. They are poor in that, that they're missing Simcha. So, so really the whole theme, we see something very special here in, 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 in this in this Itzumay uh, Shal of Simcha, I want to, I, I actually want to just share, uh, because the Rebbe also quotes about davening Ba'arichos, like the, the, the older Chassidim would daven Ba'arichos, the bitul, that where they reached, they, they just, they reached a greater level of connection. So there's a, there's a story of, I, I once heard a recent story about Avram Mayar. He would travel in America to raise funds. And he was once davening Ba'avoida, Ba'arichas, in a Chabad house. And someone walked in, and he saw him davening. This person today is a, is a, is a shliach, is a, is a, is a, he has a beautiful Lubavitcher family. And he said it was Avram Mayar's davening Ba'arichas that made him from, that affected him in a, in a, in a very powerful way. So I just wanted to share that, that Nakuda. Beautiful, beautiful. I'll also say what, what comes to mind in a, in a similar vein is shluchim, right? Not to the exclusion of not only shluchim, but shluchim is, I think, is a good example, right? Shluchim, you know, uh, chassidim are soldiers, right? You think a soldier is someone, oh, you do your job and that's it, and bittel and submission 1.0, you do what you're told, okay? That's 1.0. Then you have 2.0 is 
you know, a shliach, a shliach or, or so, someone who says, you know, I'm going to do what I want and how I feel and what's, what I'm excited about, and that's going to be my, my mission. But a real shliach is someone who is dedicated selflessly to the mission, to God's mission, to the Rebbe's mission, right? Someone selflessly dedicated to the mission of the shlichus with joy, with joy, with their own flavor, their own kach, but right on point, not deviating, not off mission, on mission, on point, but with their energy. That's the magic combo. Can we find in our lives, this is the challenge of the sicha, to, uh, the way I see it. Can we find in our lives the ability to enjoy, to enjoy what the Abisher enjoys, what God enjoys? Can we find joy in what Hashem wants? I mean, the fact that we can submit to what Hashem wants, sure. The fact that we can enjoy what we want, sure. But can we enjoy letting go and 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 being true to mission? That's unique. That's unique. That makes a very special. A special relationship and as yeah as we say that that's manifest even more than the meal more than the soda that's manifest or expressed uniquely with giving giving the gifts um, of money to the poor because it's literally stepping outside of oneself it's not feeding self it's not feeding friends it's stepping outside of oneself to help out another somebody who we, who we might otherwise other it's helping that person out and really lifting them up with joy that's the key. Beautiful. And now let's tie it back to Kimu Vikiblu Ayyhudim. How when we first going from one to three. So the joy of Purim and the, the theme of Purim and the the actions, the mitzvahs of Purim all lead us to a place where we truly willingly and reach the Abishta. Ebrista as well, which then leads us to Daimel Lashchina, which, which the Rebbe concludes in the end. Why is it Daimel Lashchina? What happens when the Ebrista takes over and we celebrate the submission willingly, and then the Ebrista takes over, and that's how we, we celebrate Purim? Why is that Daimel Lashchina? Or how? Yeah, he says, um, I'm looking here. Yeah, he said what I what I mentioned before that that to reach out, to reach out to someone who is by all accounts on a lower and, and I hate saying these words, but on a lower level than us is a very divine quality, because isn't that what Hashem does with us all day every day? <laughs> no, right. Nothing else is on His level. Right. Nothing's on God's. No one's on the Abish's level. We're all on a completely radically different, playing in a different sandbox altogether. And yet, David's just here and he's with us and he's giving to us and, and, and he's providing for us and he's, he's all in. He's all in with us when we're all in for the other. Not because we have to, because we love doing it. We love doing what the Abisher wants, which is that we should be doing that, combining all the, all the aforementioned ideas. That's divine. It's divine to step out of yourself into the other. It's kind of like the, the reason why, you know, explains the reason why human beings are called the medaber. Why are we called medaber? Not, why not the masco? If you think about what differentiates us from animal life, right? There's four kingdoms of life. There's daimim, inanimate life, tzameach, vegetation, chai, anima, uh, animals, and, and, and other forms of, you know, moving, move, move, moving, moving, li animated life. And then you have medaber, the speaker, the communicator. Why Madab? But why not masculine? You ask somebody, what's the mile of the human being? What's the advantage or quality of the human being? You would say, Seichel, intelligence, right? Creative intelligence. Dibur. Why Dibur? Because intelligence is about you. It's your brilliance, your understanding, your knowledge, your, your wisdom. Dibur, speech, is your ability to extend beyond yourself. Your ability to share a piece of yourself with someone else, to get outside of yourself. So to, to the the quality that you have within your your quality of intelligence, great. You're just you're just expanding yourself, but intelligence is an expansion of self. Speech communication is about being able to get out of yourself, and that's a much greater. That's a divine element. Self is self to get out of yourself. Now that's divine. So medaber expresses the divinity of the human being. Masculine. 
that the person is intelligent, that expresses human being. The fact that you're a medaber, that you're a communicator, you're a speaker, oh, that, that indicates, I don't mean like a professional, right? a, a communicator, somebody who could speak, that indicates that you're divine. In a similar way here, the idea that you had a meal, okay, it's still about you. But the, the, that, that it's, listen, I'm not trying to take away from that because Rebbe says that the meal, that you're inebriated, you, that indicates the, the idea of joy and submission in, in one place. But the real indication of that, the real indication of the divine element here is when you give. So I think that's uh, the practical takeaway. Look, we have a lot, of, a lot of philosophy here and a lot of concepts that are life-changing. On a practical level, I think the Rebbe drives us throughout the Sikha in, in various different spots whether it's the, the beginning of the Sikha, the Rambam, the end of the Sikha, like in all three parts, the Rebbe is driving, is pushing this idea of, of Matanas Lav of giving to the poor. And I think certainly that is, uh, that is a call of the hour, if not the call of the hour, is to extend to those in need. And certainly we live in a world where there's uh, no, unfortunately, no lack of, of, of need and no lack of opportunity to give. And uh, indeed, it should be, it is an obligation. It should be an obligation. We should do it with joy and, and do it in a divine way. I think that's uh, that call. Beautiful. Thank you, Reb Ari. Afreilichem Purim. You may mishta v'simcha. And only brachas and happiness. Amen. Amen. Thank you for, for having me on the podcast. Thank you for, uh, for uh, having this conversation together. And indeed, it should be days of joy. And uh, we should have Mashiach now. Amen. Amen.